Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar that's sponsored by the Armickey's Mechatronics, Informatics and Control Group. Uh, the proposition of our uh, webinar is that the railway industry hasn't yet properly taken on board the potentially transformational contribution that Mechatronics can offer, and we very much hope that you'll come away with a positive message in that sense. Um, so uh, this is just a quick slide about the speakers. That's me at the top. Um, I won't go through the dates, but you can see that I've been around for a long time. And I sometimes say that I was actually doing mechatronics uh, significantly before the word was popularized, particularly um, in, in Europe. Uh, my colleague Chris, who is the other presenter, now leads the Control Systems Research Group at Loughborough and actually will present the majority of the talk. My role is really to give the technical background and to get things started. So um, this is just a little bit of the historical background, if you like. In the 1970s, I said I've been around a long time, I was involved with the British Rail Development at a local be unaffected by ice or snow. This was a landmark in Birmingham, although um, subsequent lack of commercial exploitation by the National industry, it, it, I guess, kind of mitigates that in some sense. But nevertheless, it was a major success. And the project still sorry, remains a demonstration of one of the most um, sophisticated, if that's the right word, examples of mechatronic in mechatronics in action. From a suspension viewpoint, the mechanical system was stripped to the bone. The vehicle body was essentially just a suspended mass, no springs, no dampers, or other conventional suspension components that a mechanical engineer would recognize. In other words, the control, the mechatronics, did everything. So bolstered by the success of the Maglev project, we moved on uh, to find out how the ideas might translate to a conventional railway vehicle. And the lower, focus, uh, lower photos show the experimental vehicles and the installation of one of the two laterally acting actuators uh, across the vehicle suspension. And we were able to demonstrate um, a kind of halving of the acceleration levels, very significant improvements in ride quality something that was simply impossible with a purely mechanical suspension. And in some ways, that was certainly the very first uh, full-size uh, experimental demonstration of the concept. <clears throat> um, so obviously, it's important to understand exactly how we might actually use the, the concept of mechatronics. And this slide is kind of a car cartoon of this in some ways. And just in case you're not sure, mechatronics is the integration of electronics and control with the mechanical system. But a key point is that the mechanical configuration should be rethought, redesigned, to take advantage of the introduction of control technology. Of course, there has to be some kind of business benefit, so that it's not just technology for its own sake. And the slides here suggest possible benefits, cheaper, better, lighter, faster, these would, of course, have to be quantified for a particular application from a business perspective. But we must remember at the end of the day, we have to understand the benefits and how they may, might impact uh, the industry of relevance to it. Um, sorry, I've forgotten that one. Okay, so here's a, a general scheme of an active suspension that's somewhat simplistic. Um, and it's useful to think about this overall scheme, um, and, and that's what I'm trying to show here. So the, um, the normal mechanical system, suspension system, has inputs from the track, the movements of the track, the irregularities, what happens when you go around curves. And the effects of these are quantified in terms of the outputs, things like ride quality, movement of the suspension, and so on. Um, in an active suspension, there's the possibility of adding a power input. And this is quite quite important difference. With a purely mechanical system, this is actually simply not possible. Um, the other thing is that we then start to add the control, and you can actually see what we've got here um, is that uh, we now got the possibility of injecting this power from the power supply in a controllable manner. Sensors are used to measure the outputs, in other words, uh, 
ride quality, acceleration, suspension movement, and so on. Actuators are then used to regulate the power flow to and from the mechanical system on the basis of an electronic controller at the bottom there. So the overall performance is now determined by the control action almost certainly including software in the controller. So this represents a fundamental change compared with a purely mechanical system. And it does therefore require some sort of mental hurdle, mental flip, if you like, to actually appreciate uh, what's going on there. Um, an important thing to understand is that railway vehicles really are remarkably complex. So here's a, a kind of schematic of a, of a basic mechanical system. This is the configuration of a conventional so-called four-axle railway vehicle. Wheels are connected in pairs via a solid axles. And these are mounted via springs, etc., and other suspension between, within the two bogies, sorry, which are in turn connected via springs and dampers and other things to the vehicle body. There are therefore two stages of suspension, primary and secondary, and these act not only vertically and laterally, but also in rotational directions, the pitch, the yaw, the roll, and so on. So active control can be applied to either stage of suspension, primary or secondary, and of course, in any or all of the uh, directions. Um, a relatively cut down dynamic representation has in excess of 20 degrees of freedom. So it's a dynamic order for the mechanical system approaching 50. So they are certainly dynamically complex and therefore challenging in terms of control system design. So uh, that's the end of my contribution. Hopefully my slides have given you some of the basic background. I'll now hand over to Chris to pick up the story. Thank you very much, Roger. And um, just uh, afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for dialing in um, and, and spending the time to, to listen to us talk today. Um, I'm not sure if we said this yet, but there is a, um, a question and answers function. So somewhere in your, your web browser, you'll be able to post questions. So if you've got some of those, we can try and answer them as best we can as we get towards of, of, uh, the end of this session. Um, oh, thank you, so, Chris. I forgot to say that. So okay. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so just to go back to, to, to why we're doing this, I mean, Roger's set the context in terms of mechatronics and um, the, the, the system performance benefits you can get from it and reducing complexity. But why rail? Why, why now? And really, railways are going on, undergoing huge change. If you look at the railway of today and even compare it for 10 years ago in the UK, if you're a user of the railway, you'll see massive changes in terms of rolling stock, information screens, how you buy your tickets, all that kind of stuff is, is changing all the time. And the, the prevalence of high-speed rail around the world is, has just exploded over the last 20 years, particularly in developing countries or um, maturing countries such as China. If we look at UK specifically, though, the costs are eye-wateringly high in, in some instances. It's a very safe railway in the UK, but if anyone's bought a ticket, at a ticket office to go down to London for the day, um, you might be quite surprised how much it costs. So the, what the railway is, is not cheap, but it has amazing green credentials. Now, this is a bit of a mixed message sometimes because there's a lot of embedded carbon with inside a, a railway system. There's lots of infrastructure that you need to build. However, there's very few other systems which are partially or almost fully electrified like a railway can be. So energy generation, if that can be moved to more sustainable sources, gives you a, a very good credential that you can claim your system is green. But competitors are getting better. Um, the cars of today are demonstrably more comfortable, they are quieter, they are cheaper to run, they're more uh, reliable. Um, if anyone like me grew up in the 1980s with some British Leyland products, you'll know and what it's like to be stuck at the side of the road when, when they break down. But, you know, the, the, the key competitor to the railway is the car, and that's increasingly the choice that, that people make. There is, however, some, some really good, good sides to the railway at the moment. In the background, there are European-wide technical strategies, such as Shift to Rail, which has, uh, for the first time, put an emphasis on, on funding for research and fun, a fundamental look at the railways uh, through the, the European Commission. 
There are also UK rail technical visions, um, particularly led through through RSSB. And um, I'll keep mentioning RSSB through this talk because they have supported over the years an awful lot of our work, most of the things we talk about today. Uh, and they're a really good organisation to work with, and we've got a lot to thank them for. So let's go back to the, the UK industry vision. Um, and this is the, the previous technical strategy um, that was that was released almost um, sort of seven or eight years ago now, which has, I think, just been updated. So I might be slightly behind the times here, but th this was the vision of being able to run trains closer together, having minimal disruption to train services, um, efficient passenger flows, more value from data, uh, things like optimal energy use. I won't read them all, but you can see that it was, it was quite a, a vision to, to transform the railways. And if I'm being pedantic, um, I would say much of this isn't possible without a, a fundamental rethink in train design and operation. And that's really what, what we're talking about today, is, is how can we reach this, this kind of major change in how we operate railways um, with, with step changes rather than incremental changes. So I, I, I make no apologies. This is a very much a, a Loughborough-centric uh, view of the world. And, and I'm really what I'm going to do is talk about some of the work that we've been doing at Loughborough, um, particularly in the time since I've been a, an academic uh, in the university, um, and, and, and talk through some of the projects and, and some of the, the reasoning of, of why we've approached or why we approach the research in the way we do. And, and to go back to the very beginning for me, as an as a independent academic, um, I got a, a fairly modest amount of money from, from RSSB um, stroke RIUK, as it was there, for a half-cost trains competition. And showing uh, my, my bias as a, as a control engineer, I think I can solve everything with control, but the, the, the premise of what we were saying was how could you uh, use design for control and apply that to railway vehicles? and understand what the benefits are from that. And the basic premise was this. I wasn't suggesting anything terribly new. It was essentially most other industries had been through this transition. So other industries, I'm just going to highlight aerospace here, and I'll give a few more examples in a moment. Things like fly-by-wire are de rigueur in those industries. When they were considered, when they were new, to be dangerous and you could never do them, they were to be too expensive. But that transition was driven by operational benefits and, as Roger mentioned before, creating mechanical simplicity. So some of you may have seen these before if you've, if you've ever heard me talk, but I just thought I would draw comparisons over, over 50, 60 years of, of how different industries ha have changed and adopted control and mechatronics at the heart of everything that they do. And the, the picture there, if you're an airplane uh, nerd like myself, is a Hawker Hunter from uh, the mid-1950s and was our frontline jet fighter. It was all metal. It had um, swept wings, conventional tail, fundamentally dynamically um, stable, if you, if you are a control engineer and understand those things. It had conventional control, so essentially the pilot's stick and, and rudders were connected to surfaces uh, on the wings and on the tail. And it had a turbojet, which was very noisy and didn't really make much power. Step forward to, to, to today, and, and our newest frontline jet fighter, um, the F-35B Lightning, which is not without its controversies, but if you fundamentally look at it, that is a, an amazing piece of design. It has advanced composites, so the way it's constructed has changed. It's got something called relaxed stability. So, you know, without the control systems, it would essentially fall out of the sky. It's got carefree handling so that the pilot does not need to worry about the inputs he puts into the stick. It will always give him the maximum or her the maximum performance without um, departing from control flight. It's got a turbofan with reheat and um, what I've written there is, is stovel capability, so short takeoff and vertical landing. If you've ever seen one of those in the flesh um, flying, it's, it's, it's very impressive. But fundamentally, to be able to transition to that is to have mechatronics and control at the heart of the design of that system. So <clears throat> a lot of people say, well, that's military, that's very expensive, they've got loads of money to spend on it. What about the automotive industry? Now, I could have given examples of, of the powertrain stuff because I've, I've had a history in, in doing research in that area, but uh, we're talking a lot about guidance and, and suspension today. So what about suspension in the automotive industry? 
Well, this is a Mercedes, again, from a similar sort of time period in the uh, mid-1950s. Uh, W180 had uh, springs and dampers, essentially, uh, radius arms at the back. And all of the um, stability was provided by, essentially, driver skill. Go too quickly into a corner and, and you, you know you've done something wrong. Trans forward to today and you look at something like the Mercedes S-Class, which has always been a, a showcase for, for technology for Mercedes, and it's got um, air springs, uh, continuously variable damping. It's even got some uh, tilt control, which I'd not realized. It can tilt up to two and a half degrees into the corner so the passengers don't feel quite as much lateral acceleration. It's got things like feed forward road scanning, so it looks for horrible bumps in the roads um, and then feeds that back into the, uh, the suspension system. And it's got active stability augmentation. So if you go too quickly into a corner, it tries to sort things out for you before you make too much of a mess. And again, control is at the heart of that. You couldn't do these things or do these design processes without having control mechatronics engineering in there. And we get to the railway industry. And I, I'm really not trying to denigrate the railway industry here. There's been some amazing advances. But particularly with things like running gear, it has, you know, has much changed. If we look at the um, BR Mark I coach, which there are many of these still trundling around on rail tours, they had things like solid axle wheel sets, which I'll explain later. Roger talked about bogies and two stages of suspension, but were essentially fully passive systems. If we move forward to today to one of the, the latest vehicles, I mean, there, there's no comparison uh, between the, the two types of vehicle there. The, the Hitachi is a, is a much more capable vehicle than, than the Mark I. But essentially, if you look at the guidance system, it's very similar. It's got solid axle wheel sets. It's got uh, bogies, two stages of suspension, uh, and, it, and it's fully passive. Okay, so not a lot has changed in, in that period. So what is the problem in the opportunity space? If we look at the top level functionality of railway vehicles, they essentially are there to carry passengers and, and train crew. They're there to provide appropriate conditions for the passengers, um, the, the crew and the load. Uh, you need access to get on those. Um, you need to be able to connect vehicles together. Energy needs to be provided both for, for traction and also to um, provide things like the hotel load as it's known with inside the vehicle you've got to be able to accelerate uh, maintain speed brake stop uh, and all sorts of other things there another one the one of the fundamentals is the support and guide the train on the track okay and if we look at some specifics inside there so the ec mod train uh, defined lots of subsystems there are many things that we're, we're talking about today such as bogies running gear power and propulsion braking systems, onboard vehicle control, and tilt systems. And if you go back to my example, you'll see that a lot of these really fundamentally haven't changed in a dramatic sense over the years. So fundamentally, what we're talking about today is, is uh, I describe them as the oily bits, uh, the bits that, that we like to talk about as, as mechanical and, and mechatronic engineers. So if we look at things like power and propulsion, the electric train is, is mature. It's been around since pretty much since railways started, Un unlike automotive, which is essentially catching up now. They are mature uh, systems. There was a big transition from DC to, to AC motors and things like uh, distributed traction. You can do things like energy recovery, so dynamic braking, although this is fairly underused because it's difficult to store that energy uh, or put it back into the, to the grid somewhere. So there's a big opportunity, and, and a lot of people are exploring this now in terms of batteries, supercapacitors, flywheels, fuel cells. I, I guess I've probably put that in the wrong place, but as an, an alternate means of, of providing uh, traction current. And, and obviously these, these mixed modes, as they know, are, are majorly beneficial for things like diesel electric and where you've got partial electrification on, on a network. Active suspension has been, and as Roger mentioned, talked about for an awfully long time and, and, and probably not utilized in the way that it, that it should be. And as we mentioned, suspensions are primarily still passive. Uh, there are exceptions in terms of mature technologies such as, as tilt control that 
is accepted and is, is a part of the railway as we, as we speak if you go on, onto the West Coast main line. There are things like active secondary control. So in, in Japan, there is a Shinkansen uh, that has some active secondary control, but it's, it's fairly underutilized as a technology. It's not to say there hasn't been demonstrators, and we'll talk about another one today, but uh, Roger worked with Bombardier in the early 2000s with um, one of the first demonstrations of a, of a mechatronic bogey. But uh, as we speak, I don't believe that has actually been, been implemented on the railway. There are things like braking systems. Um, fundamentally, we still have uh, solid state braking, if you will, pneumatic actuation discs or onto treads. Um, and there are alternates like uh, track brakes or eddy current uh, brakes, which are underutilized in the UK or, or not used at all. Um, and what about electromechanical brakes? Most things are either pneumatic or hydraulic, uh, but there are key questions around fail safe if you do lose the power. So, and there are other opportunities as well, a bit like Roger was saying in terms of getting rid of mechanical complexity is do we need mechanical brakes at all? Uh, and one of the projects I will I talk about demonstrated that probably we don't need them uh, for the operational railway. And uh, other areas are the things like the, the more or all electric train. There's lots of subsystems on trains such as um, having to have uh, pneumatics, so you have air supplies, reservoirs, uh, which take up space and are, are complicated. And aerospace has gone down this route in terms of uh, trying to remove hydraulic and pneumatic systems and go to entirely electric. Automotive, obviously, is, is doing the same with drivetrains, braking, steering, that, that kind of thing. So what about an, uh, no pneumatic systems for a railway vehicle? The, the, and what we're trying to uh, highlight here is, is big potentials to, to make fundamental changes. So... This was a, how do I put this, cartoon that I drew about eight years ago now when I did the, the half-cost trains project. And it was just really trying to draw together uh, some of those concepts and rethink what a railway vehicle could look like. And it probably looks a bit naive today <laughs> after about eight years, but I think a lot of the things are, are still things that we should be chasing, such as um, active coupling, um, I'll explain why that in a moment. Things like um, if you're using lots of control, you've got lots of sensing, um, having things like total condition monitoring, understanding exactly the condition of the vehicle. I'll talk today about things like active suspension uh, and in-wheel traction motors. And if you use that as a fundamental part of the design process, then you don't need to have bogies and two stages of suspension, which could open up huge amounts of space with inside things like the UK's constrained loading gauge to try and get more capacity on vehicles. And we also uh, briefly touch on um, active pantographs and, and the ability to have pantographs running closer together without disturbing each other on, on a fairly soft catenary that we have in the UK. So that's really what we're talking about is, is the enabling technology today. And, and that, that's really what we focus on at, on at Loughborough. But what does it mean? What, what could it mean in terms of, of the long-term prospects of the rail industry. Well, Roger touched on mechanical simplicity, and I, I've, I've spoken that, and having things like bogey-less operation, so the, the, the very guidance system being much simpler, uh, much lighter, much more capable as well. The really exciting stuff, though, I think, are, are things like improved functionality. So there is a mechanical compromise for most railway vehicles, and, and being able to remove that compromise through control um, is a really exciting prospect and with that comes things like reduced track damage and then because these are enabling technologies and it opens up all sorts of other interesting things like new modes of operation you know do we need fixed infrastructure such as signaling can you have vehicles that talk to each other and negotiate their way through switching crossings or network nodes as, as we could refer to them so there's, there's massive amounts of potential with this that I think are not being thought about because people don't have mechatronics as, as part of their design philosophy, something that's fixed in there at the very beginning. So <clears throat> this is where I start to talk about Loughborough a bit more. And these are, I'm going to touch on, on five projects that the Control Systems Group, uh, sorry for the, the initialism there, the CSG as we call ourselves, and these are enabling technology product projects that um, we've been working on over the years. This is not all me. I will try and name drop 
colleagues um, who've, who've led these particular pieces of work. Um, but essentially what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is a vehicle guidance um, and something called vehicle-based switching, uh, which is very much a, a desktop study uh, from one of my PhD students. I'll then talk about uh, a bit more applied research, uh, working with SET, um, who are a, an, an SME based in, in Derby. Uh, briefly touch on a, a project called Kneeling Trains, which was led by a colleague of mine, um, some condition monitoring work, and then finally uh, one of the later projects, which is about uh, using control to try and decarbonize uh, the drivetrain of, of, a, of a railway vehicle. So if we look at the, the first of these, and, and this is really vehicle guidance basics, so if there's some railway engineers out there, I, I do apologize, but I think it's, it's worth having a look at what I think is one of the, the major constraints of, of railway systems, and that's how railway vehicles guide themselves. And the, the, the mechanism is, is essentially 200 years old now and, and pretty much has not changed in that time where we have two steel wheels on a steel rail that are solidly connected by an axle. So they rotate at the same speed and they have what's known as conicity. The tread is cut at an angle so that it allows the vehicle to, to move around a corner and also to self-stabilize in a straight line. These, however, are, if you look at them um, from a dynamics point of view, a unconstrained kinematic oscillator. Essentially, they hunt or they wobble around when they get to a certain speed. And there is a compromise with that. Essentially, if you want to go fast in a straight line, um, you reduce the kinicity down, but it means you can't go around corners. Or if you want to go around corners, but not fast in a straight line, you have more kinicity um, to be able to en en enable that cornering, but then you can't go fast in a straight line. So how do we get these to work? Well, we stabilize them by primary yaw stiffness. We stop them rotating, essentially, relative to the track, which um, still doesn't eliminate it completely. There's always a limit to the amount of, of hunting, so there's usually a speed limit associated with that trade-off between yaw stiffness and kinicity. And effectively, what it adds as well is, is you're creating a grinding machine. You are uh, sliding steel over the top of steel and removing material from the wheel set and the rail head. You generally also need um, a very complicated secondary suspension so you don't pass very um, uh, stiff suspension uh, shocks up to the passengers so you have things like a secondary stage of suspension and generally you then need um, secondary yaw dampers. So I've just talked about mechanical compromise but that's really what we're trying to fight against in mechatronics, that we can start to remove this compromise because it's no longer locked in mechanically. You can change things in terms of code. So there must be a better way. There are many options for, for vehicle guidance, and lots of these have been talked about before, but just, just to highlight some of them is that you can do things uh, like retrofitting, so having still bogies and, and wheel sets. So this is a, a, a four axle vehicle as, as we know it today. And opposed to having secondary yaw damping, you can replace these with actuators. So you can do clever things like dropping the yaw stiffness of the, the wheel sets down. So they become a little bit more unstable, but you can, and they curve better, but you can get the stability back with secondary yaw control. So you can actuate solid axles, so directly, as opposed to via a secondary sense, as I've shown there on the left-hand side, um, and you can put actuators in. But really, the, the issue you have with, with this is, is that the wheel set itself is a control system, and you are augmenting it with another control system on top. So you are fighting one control system with another control system. So the, the better way, essentially, is to disconnect the wheel sets go more towards the, the kind of automotive concept of having differential wheel speeds across an axle and then using some form of actuation to be able to control that yaw to steer the vehicle into the corner because as soon as you disconnect the wheel sets, you lose the, uh, the steering, the natural steering mechanism associated with them. There is a, a final step that you can go and, and you can combine together wheel motors uh, essentially being able to provide a differential torque across the axis, or the axle, sorry, which can also provide you with a, a traction mechanism. Okay, and, and I've not really talked about it here, but you, as we said before, um, these could be applied to, to bogey systems, or they could be applied to much more simple two-axle vehicles. 
So um, I'll give some credit here to, to my former PhD student who's, who's now off, off in industry, uh, Nabila Farhat, but she looked through all of these, these concepts, um, did some, some great work in terms of looking at these in, in terms of multi-body physics simulations. And, and as has been seen before in, in other uh, methods of modeling, that you do get a demonstrable reduction in, in track and, and wheel damage. But the, the really exciting thing that she looked at was that, uh, you know, if you are steering a vehicle, can you get it to steer through a switch? Uh, and this opens up um, interesting possibilities in terms of do you need um, track switches which have um, very well-known failure modes and constraints on networks? Can you have a, a fully passive switch, for example, that means that you have a lot less maintenance burden out in um, some, some pretty remote places where we currently have, have to send people? The intelligence comes onto the vehicle instead. So um, Nabila looked at steering vehicles through con uh, conventional switches, and you can get fairly dramatic reductions in um, the damage that you cause. So th this is something called a, a, a T-gamma uh, metric, which is essentially how much energy that you put into the track. And that's correlated then back to, to track damage. And you can get huge reductions, sort of a quarter of the amount of track damage associated with a, an active vehicle rather than a passive vehicle. So that's some of the, the, the background research that we do. Um, Nabil, well, Nabila actually worked on this project as well, but we, uh, one of my biggest projects recently was with SET in, in Derby, who, who led the project and have been working on the concepts of wheel motors for, for a very long time. The concept of this project, again, I should mention sponsored by RSSB, uh, was to have a retrofit of four wheel motors per, per bogey. And these were there to provide traction and guidance um, but to get the stability back and the guidance, we needed to put a, a closed loop control system around that. So several uh, measures were required, or, and also measurements required. I'll talk about that in a moment. So this was, uh, before I got on the project, demonstrated on the 636 uh, tram. It's an ex-Blackpool tram owned by one of the directors of SET. But the fundamentals with this was, can we apply the concepts to a, a heavy rail application? So it was a very collaborative project. Um, SET uh, led the work because they were the owners of the technology in terms of the wheel motors. They designed the new bogey system. They did the systems integration. They essentially built a new railway vehicle as well, which was a, a very impressive undertaking. We had academic partners in the University of Huddersfield. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, Roger works across the two institutions at the moment. Um, but they essentially created the vehicle dynamics model in, in SIMPAC. Um, we're testing our controllers and did lots of work around standards requirements and, and failure modes uh, because it's another one of those key questions people always ask about mechatronics. At Loughborough, we, we took a, the lead on the guidance control design, uh, doing that uh, from first principles, uh, looking at estimators. I'll talk about those a little bit and also uh, sensing and control hardware requirements. So we worked with, with SAT, SET in terms of um, um, things like sample rate, where do we want sensors, what do we need as, as feedback signals. And then VivaRail were the final partner who provided the, uh, the essentially the ex-London Underground stock um, to, to build the demonstrator. So this project uh, started in the spring of 2017, and it was, a, like I say, a fairly integrated process where SET led on the wheel motor development. Uh, Huddersfield created the models uh, that we then took away and, and played with to create the controller designs fed those back into some controller testing in the simulation environment. We did some interim testing on the 636 tram at, at Worksworth. Uh, that allowed, allowed us to do some model validation, uh, could update our controllers, and then eventually we went round that loop again once we got the full uh, class 230. So a, a fairly classical mechanical engineer, or sorry, mechatronics engineering approach where you know the, the mechanical, the control, the dynamic side all, all has to work together to get the, the system um, operational. So, as I mentioned, um, Huddersfield led on, on the vehicle dynamics in terms of uh, uh, SIMPAC model. So, they built that from um, previous models of, uh, of the underground stock. We did a lot of stuff in, in terms of MATLAB Simulink, uh, and we kind of met in the middle in something called co-simulation, which is a really powerful tool for understanding, are your control systems going to work before you, you get them on the real system? And again, a very... Um, well-known process for people who, who, who work in, in, in the aerospace industry and, and for sure in the automotive industry as well. The control is 
very non-trivial for these systems because they're essentially unstable to start with. So we, we looked at lots of different structures, single input, single output loops, uh, classical loops in terms of cascaded controllers, state feedback. We also considered um, things like gain scheduling are also quite important. And, and the thing with railway vehicles is, is that you've got to be robust to lots and lots of different things. So you don't know what the track's doing. The speed can vary. Most of the time, you don't know what the curve radii is. There are big uncertainties in terms of mass, as in how many passengers are on the vehicle. Have you, do you know the, the weight of the vehicle? Do you know what the stiffness of the suspension system is? Do you know what the damping is? Um, you can have areas of low adhesion between the wheel and the rail. And then some application side stuff, such as controller discretization and you know, the, the control power that you have, is that going to cause you instability issues? So again, um, we, we worked with Huddersfield and got the SIMPAC models. We did some um, linear uh, sort of low-order simulation models. We used those to create the designs and then applied those back on, on the simulation models. Again, very, very classical engineering, sorry, control engineering approaches. And there's some nice squiggly lines to frighten undergraduates with um, if anyone sat through control courses and wondered what we're talking about. So these are Nichols diagrams that we use to understand stability before we put them back on the, the SIMPAC model. So one of the key things is, is actually knowing where the vehicle is, and you generally need some feedback signal, and one of the major ones was, was knowing uh, the lateral position. So where do you steer the vehicle to? We had a backup in terms of laser measurement, uh, but essentially what we were trying to say is, is can we use um, inertial measurements and, and model-based feedback essentially to, to work out where we are. Now, we, we got that to work in, in the high fidelity simulations, but this is still a, a key question for this technology and something that still needs proving on the real system. So we did lots of track testing, preliminary work with the, the 636 at, uh, at Worksworth, um, and then eventually worked up to the, um, the Class 230, and again, that was at Worksworth. And I'm just going to hopefully show a video now of that work. The ActiWheel project is to change dramatically the way that rail vehicles run on the railway. It can produce more torque, more driving force on one side or the other in order to steer the wheel set down the centre line of the track. Rail vehicles elsewhere have not done that for the last 200 years and what we want to do is to see this technology implemented as the technology of choice for rail passenger vehicles in the future. So our solution has the motor integrated into the wheel. That means there's no um, transmission between the two. There are no moving parts beyond a bearing, which every wheel and axle has, and there's no friction braking systems. So we can really reduce the amount of maintenance that needs to be done. These are very high reliability, very durable systems. We expect our wheels to last somewhere between four to ten times longer than a conventional setup. And we've done a comparison between our system in operation and the conventional arrangement that was originally fitted to this train. And the two graphs show um, the level of wear that the train would be having on its wheels and on the track compared to the level of wear that we're achieving. And as you can see, our line is basically flat. It doesn't cause any wear. That means the rail isn't being damaged, the wheels aren't deteriorating, and we save money. The exciting thing for me about this in-wheel motor technology is the way that you can completely rethink the design of railway vehicles. What you see is a, a mechanical compromise that takes up space, takes a, uh, well, uses a lot of weight and, and frankly a lot of steel to get these things to run down the track. We can remove bogies, so those trucks underneath the car. We don't need those anymore, which would free up space within inside the vehicles. And if you save mass, then it means it's a lot easier to accelerate, decelerate, and of course that there is additional carrying capacity for passengers, which is what rail vehicles are all about. OK. Um... Hopefully that played okay. Um, I, I should have a special mention for Martin, who's one of the directors of the company there. He absolutely loves driving trains uh, and hogged it most of the time the testing was going on, and that's, that's him at the end of, end of the video. So um, that was a very exciting project for us, and it was great to see that this, you can get this stuff to work. Um, 
so a, a few brief projects. Now, this was led by my, my colleague Peter Hubbard here at, at Loughborough, and it was about platform train interfaces. And again, the use of mechatronics to try and reduce that gap for very uncertain platform interfaces. So people um, who have difficulty boarding trains uh, can uh, access. Uh, and th this was, again, a, a bit of a nicked concept, if I will, from, from uh, kneeling the vehicle down um, for, for buses, and it's, it's a very well-accepted concept these days. So um, Pete worked with one of our researchers uh, and used SIMPAC again to, to understand how much you would have to kneel the vehicle to get in towards the platform. So you can see this is a vehicle approaching uh, the, the control forces that needed and, and how much you could close close the gap. So there were some key questions around how much you have to um, um, kneel the vehicle to get close to the to the uh, to the platform. Uh, we've done lots of condition monitoring projects over the years, so this was just one one to highlight. It was another RSSB sponsored project, um, rail operator comp challenge competition. Uh, we worked with uh, Talent, who led the project. Southern Rail uh, were our uh, place of demonstration. Uh, Birmingham did lots of the hardware, and we worked with Hummerware in terms of some of the software. Uh, and essentially, what we were trying to do was was look at combined diagnostics and, and prognostics. So treating the bogey as a system rather than a lot of condition monitoring, which is look at different components and see what's broken and, and what's not broken. Um, so we did a lot of stuff in simulation, but essentially the, the, the really exciting thing was we got to instrument a vehicle. But exciting, but also can be frustrating because of the insurance requirements of the railway. So we were quite constrained in terms of how much data we got towards the end of the project. And you know, it's one of the things from the rail technical strategy is about um, getting things quicker onto the railway, doing testing quicker. And, and this was a real key example of how difficult it can be just to get sensors even onto a bogey on the operational railway. Um, like I said, we got some good concepts out of it. We could estimate things like springs and dampers and, and look at the, the overall bogey health. But um, we're still getting data off that, and we're still playing with those concepts at the moment. Um, this project's um, decarbonisation of, of railway vehicles was led by uh, my colleague Will Midgley, um, and it was trying to look at something things that have been explored before, but in terms of um, improving the, 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 the dynamics understanding, and I'm specifically looking at, at CO2 emissions of, of things like BIMO trains, and, and uh, really trying to come up with a model platform that you could essentially plug and play and try lots of different concepts, lots of different control algorithms to um, it reduce the CO2 output of, of trains. So um, one of my researchers, Tim Harrison, um, built models of the, the railway vehicle drivetrain, so inputs such as timetable, gradients on the outside, uh, gearboxes, the dynamics of the vehicle, things like the DC bus inside, and it's just dropped off the bottom, but things like overhead line equipment and the power that comes in from that. And so that looks like a conventional electric vehicle. You could then add things like uh, diesel engines, generators to have a bi-mode system, and the, the adaptability is there to have things like energy storage and DC to DC converters. So you're starting to talk about things like tri-mode or hybrid trains. So there's some real depth of work in the modeling there and the dynamics um, that you can, you can plug and play, like I say, and, and change things around and see what happens. So... This was not just a modeling exercise by itself. We did our best to collect data and validate these models. So uh, Tim and Will sat on a train for a day going up and down between London and, and the southwest, collecting data from uh, Class 082 uh, with their data loggers. And then this was applied back to, to the models to see how close we got with them. And you can see there is um, fundamental uh, matching up there in terms of train speeds. There are some variations to do with how drivers actually move their vehicles around the network. Uh, but fundamentally, they, these are getting close from very first principles modeling and, and applying these to, to quite a complicated system when you think about it on the railway. Now, they looked at a few combinations and, and things like control parameters. Um, moving things around with control really didn't give you huge amounts of gains. Um, things like selective engine shutdown probably unsurprisingly gave huge gains in terms of if, if you shut these down in the appropriate places, you could get things like 10% reduction in, in CO2. And it's probably other countries use this more than ourselves, but um, it's probably an underutilized thing in, in the UK at the moment. 
Um, the other thing was predictive arrival time and, and changing driver driver behaviours. And again, people have looked at this before, but I think this is the first time it's been applied to more high fidelity models to give you uh, as close as we can get to to a, a CO2 output. So that's the advert for, for Loughborough Over, and, and hopefully a bit of a background in terms of why we do this and why we think it's, a, it's an underutilised concept. But we have in our own minds this mechatronic roadmap. It, naive, some of it will work, some of it won't do. But what we believe is the things that we're talking about are, are step changes, not just incremental nudges forward. That, and, and does this fit against the vision? Well, we think so. Running trains closer together, um, things like condition monitoring, having vehicles that, that can talk to each other. And a lot of the things that we talked about are enabling technologies. They're not the solutions in themselves, but they, they, they're a step on the way to being able to do these things. So things like minimal disruption, having much more simple mechanical systems that need a lot less maintenance, uh, more value from data. So we've talked about condition monitoring, using feedback signals to get things to, to work, optimal energy use, again, um, colleague will start to look at things like that more space on trains well that's something that mechatronics can can enable um, if you use it as a fundamental part of the design services time to the second again very similar concept if you can get trains to talk to each other talk to each other through junctions uh, intelligent trains is part of that and and this whole thing about low-cost railway solutions mechanical simplicity has, has got to reduce costs in the long run and accelerated research and development. And I've, I've sort of talked about some of the frustrations with that, um, but the, the, the techniques and the tools that we're using, I, I really believe should be more prevalent in the industry. And, and hopefully that's a generational thing and, and will happen. But there's still lots to do. And, and I guess there's no technological reason why we can't do this stuff, but why not? Um, I, I've probably spoken about this before, but is, is this just a psychological issue? Is there a reason why this is not taken up uh, in the railway industry. Okay, thank you very, very much for listening. Um, Roger, are you, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, so I think there's a, a... I've got five questions so far. If anyone's got anything else, I'll, I'll try and read through them and we'll see if we can answer these. I think we've got just under 15 minutes. So what can we, the UK, learn from developing countries such as China, who are not the richest countries in the world, but build high-speed rail rapidly and cheaply as well as make it? Uh, Roger, do you want to try and answer that one? <laughs> yes, I mean, I think uh, it, 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 the high-speed rail is not necessarily cheap in China. It's just that they are investing large amounts into what they see as critical infrastructure for the country um, and the economic prosperity that actually comes from moving um, people around efficiently. So I, I think in some ways the kind of things we're doing in Europe are significantly ahead of China and indeed, I guess, Japan as well. Um, obviously, they operate very eff effective high-speed rail systems, but they're based largely upon conventional technology. So what we're trying to do, if you like, is create a technological edge that will give us um, uh, improved performance at, at reduced cost. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's Andrew from, I should have said that, that's Actar who, who asked that one. So the next question is from Andrew at DB. Um, and interesting presentation. Thank you for that, for saying it's an interesting presentation. And this is a, a sort of classic question in terms of control systems increasing complexity and actually increasing failure modes and, and particularly as systems age. Um, uh, how do we equate the additional part count and complexity with reduced cost and ticket prices? Um, I, I would counter that, and I would say it's probably the opposite way around. I mean, what we're trying to suggest here is that you have mechanical simplicity uh, and, and add the, the, the control system on top. You're obviously increasing the control system complexity, but, but really um, every other industry has gone this way, and it, it's not been proven that things are more unreliable. Um, you, you know, look at road vehicles. I would much prefer to drive my, my modern vehicle than something from the 1980s. They are so much more efficient. They don't break down all the time. You don't have to service them every five minutes. And, and, and also, you know, things like air, aircraft went down exactly the same approach for reliability, for um, performance requirements as well. I think it removes a lot of those trade-offs. And in and, and some ways, it's a, it's a psychological thing. I mean, yeah. Roger, you had, a, you, you had a brilliant quote about this from the railway, from the I... aerospace industry. Yes, I got some quotes from the 1960s when people were suggesting fly-by-wire for aircraft and 
there were some very interesting quotes from different people like the railway operators, like the system owners, um, railway engineers in general, as to all the reasons why you'd never do fly-by-wire. And, and, so, and they're not dissimilar to the kind of uh, criticisms that people um, address at the, um, at the, the technology now. It's really getting over, as Chris says, a hurdle, a technological hurdle. But once you've done it, actually, the, the benefits are, are there. And uh, properly engineered, this shouldn't be a problem. I mean, it's more difficult keeping a plane in the air if things go wrong. Um, it's much easier to keep a train on the track if things go wrong. Uh, and so that's really another comment. Uh, so, we're, you know, it, it's, it's not a, a particularly well quantified uh, answer, but at least it's something. Okay, so David Vincent from Perpetuum has, has sorry, I should have used the surname there, but David from Perpetuum has um, asked a couple of questions um, around wheel wear, uh, tread wear, RCF, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, it's an open question, really, is the answer to that one. Um, the one thing that we really haven't looked at is the optimization of, of what tread do you need? Do you need a pH? Do you need something else? Um, it's very. You essentially get a low, rid of a lot of the longitudinal forces, but you still have lateral forces to get the thing to go round the corner. But the control system opens up the opportunities of spreading the wear across the, um, the the tread, and I think that's that's something that we really haven't explored. But something that came up from the SET project was was well, what are you designing for? You know, what what is is it that you're optimising against? And I think that's a that's a really open question at the moment. Um, and how that feeds into RCF and things like T gamma is is another open question because a lot of those models are done for um, standard wheel sets. But from the simulations, we know that we massively reduce down longitudinal creep forces. How that feeds into longer term stuff is is a uh, I think really a, an open question at the moment. Is there yeah. anything you want to add to that, Roger? Yeah, I was just going to say, and also, of course, you don't need to follow exactly the same path through curves and down the straight, uh, because electronically you can actually uh, twitch, if you like, it sideways so that you actually cover the railhead more effectively. Okay. Um, I've got one from Rebecca uh, from Selic Rail, and, and I, I accept the oh, slap on the wrist. As well. I, I, I accept the, the slap on the wrist, Rebecca, because Rebecca did um, essentially write the bid with us and SET. Well, SET employed Rebecca to, to write the bid uh, that was successful for doing the, the wheel motor project. So thank you very much to Rebecca for that. She was a, a real help during that project and, and kept us online and, and stopped us. Uh, waffling through meetings when we're deciding what to write. So, so thank you, Rebecca. She does have a question, and, and I think this is, is one of the key ones, and, and um, I'm not sure how well we're going to answer this, but you know, what's the route to market? Um, how viable is it? Who will buy it? Um, this is, uh, and, and I've spoken to Rebecca a lot about this in, in the past, and this is the frustrating thing at the moment. And I, I think a lot of the way the rail industry is set up is de-incentivized to take new technology uh, and, and take a risk and, and to move things forward. Um, and it really took champions in, in the aerospace industry, like Roger was mentioning, to, for people to go, no, we're doing this. We want this because of this, this, and this. And I think it's changing. I think, I think the receptiveness to mechatronics is changing. But I think it needs structural change in some ways to get these things to work. But if we want to fulfill those rail technical strategies, if they're not just pie in the sky, nice things to write every 10 years, I think we need a fundamental rethink like this. Um, I'm not a politician, so it's, it's difficult for me to influence that in many ways, but we're doing what we can in terms of getting this, this out there, talking to people, demonstrating what these changes are. And, and hopefully, as, as a generation changes, there will be less, oh, we can't do that because a sensor might break. There'll be people who, who, who've grown up with this technology and that we influence through universities and they become champions in the, in the industry for us. Um, Roger, I know this is a bugbear of yours as well. <laughs> Uh, well, I think you said it all, actually. Uh, but the the European separation of vehicles and track is, is is a very tricky one with different different timescales and and contractual arrangements. So, um, in, in some ways, the biggest benefit of track friendly trains is, of course, the track and finding the way of actually providing uh, effective cash flows across the boundary between the infrastructure provider and and the vehicle operator is a tricky one. Okay, um, so Michael uh, said about independently rotating wheels and zero wear, uh, giving a thought to other problems. I think we answered this a little bit before in terms of rolling contact fatigue, and, and, and that's, that is a key question in terms of um, 
somewhere is good, as you, you probably realise on, on a railhead, if you get micro cracks and you have a wheel set that chews it up a little bit, then you get rid of those micro cracks and you, and you have less of an issue uh, with the track failing. But that is a an ununderstood bit of what we're doing at the moment is, is how that affects the operational operational railway. So I can't give you a really good answer to that one. Um, what will be the final? So uh, Matthew from from Uclan, uh, what would the final tipping point for the rail industry to to make the jump to using mechatronics and control systems? Uh, would we say some piece of technology? Certain. Again, I think we've probably tried to answer this already, but uh, some of it is you need a push and a pull. And a lot of the pull comes from the government specifying what trains they want, what operational requirements they need. And if it becomes impossible to do it with a standard railway vehicle, or if it becomes impossible for a new vision of the railway, because you know, COVID has changed all our perspectives on the world and how much people travel around, and does it need to be a more um, a smaller railway, smaller vehicles, which give you much more personal um, experience? I think that's that's the only way that it's going to get there in, in the short term is for politicians to, to provide that shove that we, we need to change fundamentally what the railway industry is. Um, yeah, I think I, I suspect it will come from a, a company, an industry champion saying, this is what we're offering, guys. This is what you buy. But it's a very tricky one to get people to accept. Time scale, 20 years, 30 years, it's not going to be less than that. We, we wondered if HS2 might be an opportunity, but it's clear they're going to go for fairly conventional rolling stock technology, albeit obviously uh, engin uh, engineered to, to, to modern standards. Okay, so we've got um, Phil from, from GCR. Are mechatronics used on tilting trains? Yes, they are. So it's one of the things that we mentioned. Obviously, Roger worked on, on the prototypes of those when he was at British Rail Research. Um, and, and obviously, Roger worked on, on APT as well. Um, John, who's retired, um, vehicle guidance uh, is impressive, but doesn't every vehicle on the route need to be fitted? Yes, and, and this is, uh, again, another key question that we, we always have to answer. I mean, we're in the fortunate position in universities that we can dream big. You know, we can sit here and think about things in terms of the long term. But then we always have to ground it in reality. So um, the, the work that Nabila did in terms of vehicle by switching, she was just initially looking at can you get it to guide through a conventional switch? So can you see, show some... Uh, potential benefits but you are uh, sorry on an existing system but you're entirely right that you would need to completely change the system um, and, and we, we always saw that as a, as a slow change process or if you're doing a new build you know if, if you are doing a mention it quietly if you're doing a HS2 uh, you could have that as, as a fundamental part of, of the, the system that you're building. Um, we did uh, as part of the, the study we have actually considered route maps, if you like, from where we are now to where we might be in the long term. So it is something we thought about, but it, it, it's, a, it's an issue. There's no question about that. Okay. Um, Emil from TFL. Hello, Emil. Thank you very much for listening in today. Um, Emil and I, are, uh, we do some judging on one of the uh, uh, the, the IMEC's journals uh, for the prizes. So thank you for listening today. Um, and this is an interesting one. Does the increased use of mechatronic systems on rail vehicles mean the industry needs to rethink how it deals with obsolescence? Mm. Yeah, and I think you've experienced that, Roger, haven't you? I've done some, I did quite a lot of work with the aerospace industry, actually, in terms of uh, strategies for obsolescence, and it is, it is a big issue. But I guess we've still got the same, we've got the same problem with all the ele other electronics that's stuffed onto uh, railway vehicles, uh, you know, the, the communication systems, the management systems. So I'm not so sure it's something that suddenly appears, Emil, with um, mechatronic suspension systems. I think you had, I was meaning more in terms of maglev, Roger, and the unsupporting of the, the oh, yes. Birmingham maglev. That was definitely a problem that you came up against. It was, oh. yes. And what, the maglev was deemed uh, unreliable, but actually it wasn't actually unreliable as such. It operated very effectively with zero track maintenance, interestingly, throughout its life. But the problem really was they, they had not done any project developments and they were running out of spare parts and not making putting spare parts on the shelf, so to speak. So it was actually the fact there was nothing to replace things rather than actually reliability per se. Okay, um, so we've got Thomas from TE Connectivity, and he asks about um, why the reluctance in the rail industry to adopt new technology. Uh, what's the difference between aerospace and rail? Good question. Um, again, another one we've, we've tried to wrestle with over the years. And I've, some of it's the like we've mentioned about champions taking this on and, and understanding that 
you know you've got to compete and and have these step changes in performance and the way that you you do things i i think some of the the system locks you in as well in the railway industry um I guess people in the rail industry are so concerned with getting their trains to run because if they don't run, they don't make money and you can't change things going forward for the future. So um, some other industries make that investment. And if you look at the amount of money that people like Mercedes-Benz invest in, in the technology for tomorrow, I'm not sure we do the same in the rail industry. And I, I think that that psychology needs to change. I mean, we used to. I mean, look at where Roger worked at British Railway Search. That was some amazing pioneering work. Um, but we got rid of all our research centres. It's it's coming back in terms of things like Ukraine, which I haven't mentioned, which we are well part of, so the UK Rail uh, Research and Innovation Network. But um, it's a difficult one. <laughs> I'm, I'm really not. I'm, it's a kind of mumbly answer there. Um, any, anything to add, Roger? Yeah. Hi, Tom. Nice, nice. Thanks for your question. Um, yes, aerospace and rail fleet sizes are not dissimilar. Actually, hundreds, hundreds of uh, of units, if you like. Aerospace doesn't have this inextricably linked with the infrastructure in quite the same way. Obviously, it does when you get to the uh, the airports, but um, certainly in terms of um, the control side of things. Uh, so I think that is a fundamental difference. And also, um, I guess the nature of the industry um, in rail, the, the we call it a privatized industry, but it's actually not really. It's heavily influenced by government more so, whereas aerospace is, is much more international i think in many ways so i think that's a, a difference okay so I, i'm conscious it's one o'clock i mean there's a few more questions i'm happy to try and answer them if you are roger we can if we're okay to keep going that's fine um so daniel i think he's from snc um thanks for the interesting presentation has anyone looked at the cost benefit risk compliance and compatibility i think Roger, you've been working on that recently. We've looked at it, and uh, it's something that Huddersfield looked at in terms of the uh, the cost-benefit trade-offs and things like that. Um, it really needs, needs to be done for a very specific um, application. I think also some people in Sweden have done something very similar. Um, and uh, But it's a difficult one. When are they introducing something quite different? Um, producing a cost-benefit study that people will believe is interesting, and... and I would probably criticise Hyperloop, for example, as a concept for ground transportation, where they've produced some daft cost benefits, says he, that's my personal view, um, which really would never think. I think probably we, we are um, a bit closer to producing some realistic cost benefits. The question from Graham in terms of as you add more control components, do you uh, add single points of failure? How do you minimize this? Um, by designing the control system properly, um, look at the aerospace examples where there's there's never a single actuator, there's multiple actuators. Um, you have uh, voting in terms of, of sensing. Uh, you have robustness in terms of the computation by having multiple things there. So um, the, the failure modes of of control systems can can be designed out. Obviously, there's a compromise in terms of the complexity that you add, but it, it's really strange that you actually improve the system's performance by adding complexity, or you improve the system's reliability. There's some fairly good and well understood maths around that. Um, anything to add on that, Roger? Well, it's generally not a single actuator doing the control. It's a set of actuators, and if you lose one, as long as you don't lose them all, which I guess is behind your single point of failure question, you have to make sure you don't lose them all, and then you can actually keep going fairly well. And that's just, in fact, what what aerospace does um, in the same way, avoiding, you know, making different power supplies and things like this. So there are well understood ways of actually doing this, Graham. Um, James from SNC, you mentioned about active coupling. Yeah, I, I didn't really talk about the benefits. I mean, this is something that Roger's been talking about for a long time in terms of. Um, coupling vehicles on the move and, and Rebecca who's on, on the call as well has worked with uh, colleagues at, at um, Coventry who were, who were looking at the concept of joining and detaching trains so the idea is that you could go from multiple urban centres at one side um, platoon the trains in the middle on a high speed section and, and then separate them out as you get somewhere else so it becomes more of a, a, a personal journey you know it might be that you, you, you tap into your phone you don't buy a ticket, it just tells you where to go, what time, which seat to sit on, and you eventually end up at, at your um, at your destination. And and I think really what we've been working on is, is the enabling technology for that, that. There are lots and lots of different ways of thinking about the railway. We're, we're very wedded to a timetable, and you buy a ticket, and you get somewhere, and then you might have to go onto a different train, and, and really should it be. 
Um, I think there's some really exciting things that we we can do that we're we're not considering at the moment. Um, so Stuart um, asked about uh, light rail tram train systems. Um, could the same benefits be there? Uh, and the original SET project, which Roger worked on, I wasn't on that one, uh, was very much about light rail. Uh, if there's anything to say on that one, Roger? No, no, I think it applies across all different types of uh, of, 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 tra of, of train type systems, trams. Um, and um, obviously the, the business case varies quite significantly between them. But no, no problem at all. So, uh, Vika from Data Lays Limited, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, but uh, why tilting trains instead of standardized platform heights? Um, you're entirely right, standard platform heights would be the ideal, but they're not. We've got a huge legacy of Victorian infrastructure in the UK, um, and it was a way of uh, short, medium term trying to cope with that because the civil engineering challenge of changing everything in one go was just is, is very difficult and, and time consuming. And can we could put it, again, it's the same thing, can you leave the DOM system in terms of the Uh, change and maintain. Um, here in, sorry, we've got Barry um, from Rail Projects, and he's saying um, here in Malaysia, an ongoing problem is swaying of trains on straight track. Is there an aftermarket solution? I keep losing audio, so I may not hear your answer. Um, I, I suspect that's a stability issue or, a, or a, a track issue with the design of the vehicle. I mean, I think we need to understand that a bit more uh, to give you a proper answer. Um, uh, and, so, yeah. yeah. So um, Hugh from Fraser Nash has asked about there's a great advantage of passive suspension that requires zero power to support the vehicle weight. Replacing it with an actuator requires significant power input just to support the vehicle weight. How does this square with the requirement to reduce power consumption and decarbonize? So um, I don't think we're talking in terms of having purely an active vertical suspension. Um, the, the, the key benefits really come from, from the guidance system, so it would be in combination with a, with a, a vertical passive suspension. Even with the single stage, you would still have a, a spring to support the mass. It's, it's then in terms of you use the actuator to control the compromise between um, the shocks from the track passing up to the vehicle body. I think I've answered. I think that's what you were you were referring to there. Did, did anything yeah, and, and Hugh, I mean, generally speaking, the calculations we've done put the the vehicle power consumption typically a few hundred watts at the, at the most, depending upon what you're actually doing, whether it's primary or secondary suspension. So, uh, although initially one might think there's lots of power required, it, it turns out it's, it's not so much an issue. Okay, um, I think the rest are comments. I mean, um, I mean, what I, I should really say is, if there's any any further questions, feel free to email Roger or myself. I'm sure our contact details are on the the IMACE website. If not. We're usually quite easy to find as academics. Just put Chris Ward, Loughborough, or Roger Goodall, Loughborough, or Huddersfield, and you'll find our email addresses. So if we've not answered anything or you want to talk further, um, please please get in contact. But I think we're down at the end of the questions. Um, I, I guess from me, that's just thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the questions that, that have come in. Um, Roger, anything you want to say? No, no, you've covered it very well. Thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I guess, uh, Natalie, that's uh, that's us finish for today. I guess somebody closes it down, but there you go. I'm hoping so. <laughs>